The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. I am honored to host today's guest. She's a leading UFO abduction and contact researcher, experiencer advocate, and best selling author who's researched UFOs and the non human entities associated with highly advanced aerial vehicles through her own groundbreaking research, investigation, and experimentation. I'm talking about today's guest, Kathleen Martin. Kathleen's research has extended to archival collections and the U.S. government's involvement in the investigation of UFOs and its major studies. She's a certified practitioner of regression hypnosis and quantum healing hypnosis techniques. We talk about so much in this episode. We talk about how her interest in UFOs and contact began in 1961 when her aunt and uncle Betty and Barney Hill had a close encounter and subsequent abduction in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and how she continues to seek the scientific analysis of the compelling evidence today. So, join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Kathleen Martin. Enjoy. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. How about you? <laughs> hey, so far, so good. Uh, I'm here. I'm ready to talk to you, and I'm more so ready to listen. Kathleen, can you share with our listeners and our viewers who you are and what it is you've been up to? Wow. <laughs> How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I began when I was 13 years old, when my aunt and uncle, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, had their close encounter and subsequent abduction in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So that is how long I have been interested in this. I was 13 years old at the time. Uh, And I had the opportunity to observe the uh, wonderful investigators involved in that case. They were, many of them had doctorates. Uh, They were true professionals. And I thought maybe one day I would love to do that too, because this is so interesting. But I grew up, I went to college, I became, uh, I was studied to be a psychiatric social worker, ended up becoming an educator, education services coordinator. So I'm probably using all of those skills right now in, <laughs> in the work that I do, I think. But uh, in 1990, I decided to leave my profession and begin my uh, quest, I guess you would call it, to to understanding what this is all about. And I began with uh, my investigation of my aunt and uncle's case. Of course, I didn't know how to investigate. I'd observed others. but So I joined the Mutual UFO Network and immediately trained to become a field investigator. And uh, did the research, extensive research on my aunt and uncle's case over a period of about 15 years. And it still goes on. I've just released in 2021, the 60th anniversary edition of Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, which is updated with new scientific information. So I'm really excited because as science advances, uh, we have more evidence that there experience was real. And uh, I have, at this point, written six books. I wrote three with nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, with whom I worked for about 14 years. We had a really good relationship for writing because he was, of course, a physical scientist, and, and I'm a social scientist. And 
the two combined very well uh, from different perspectives. And so I thought we worked very well together for because we shared those common interests and had a, a great deal of respect for one another. And uh, so my new book, Forbidden Knowledge, a personal journey from alien abduction to spiritual transformation has just been released. And it is uh, different from my other books because it's very personal and it's about my story and some of my experimental work as well. So uh, I don't know what else I can tell you. I was, well, I was the Mutual UFO Network's director of uh, field investigator training for 10 years. I was the Mutual UFO Network's director of experiencer research for 10 years. Uh, in that second volunteer position, I started out with three members of the team and ended up with 50. Wow. Uh, kind, compassionate people who spoke uh, non-judgmentally to experiencers who wanted to share their story with someone who wouldn't laugh at them or ridicule them. And uh, we also had six uh, mental health professionals that we used as consultants. Mm. So um, we were able to acquire a great deal of information from them too. I stepped down from that last year uh, uh, to become more independent. The reason initially was because my husband uh, was in the hospital. He had sepsis. He uh, was in the hospital extraordinarily ill for a couple of weeks. And then he had about a year-long recovery period. So uh, I had to run the family businesses. I couldn't just do everything. Right. And so I stepped down from my volunteer position. Hmm. And and is your husband on the mend? Yes, he is. He's doing awesome. much better now. Good. He's regaining his strength. He had surgery last September, and uh, yeah, he's moved coming along very well. So I'm very feel blessed mm -hmm. to to have a husband in good health again. Oh, well, I'm very glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Oh. Gosh, you know, you've had such a journey and, you know, being able to now finally tell your story. And I think that's just so wonderful, you know, especially, you know, now having your brand new book, Forbidden Knowledge. Walk us through what were some of the first, I guess, feelings or thoughts that you were starting to have when you maybe felt like, you know, I need to share my story. <laughs> I was kicking and screaming about that. I didn't want to share my story. I thought that I would go to my grave without ever sharing that part of it because my aunt and uncle endured such ridicule from mm -hmm. disinformants and their phone was tapped, their house was entered and just weird things were done to freak them out. Uh, there was a psychological operation going on against them. And I certainly didn't want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. But we have moved along over the past 60 years quite a lot. Uh, you know, now the federal government admits that uh, we have UAPs in our atmosphere, that they uh, are not something from our planet. It's, uh, technological, uh, it's technologically advanced mm -hmm. to the point where we don't even understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lou Elizondo, who uh, ran the ATIP program for a number of years, uh, recently did an interview where he said that uh, there's no reason to believe that the people who are inside these craft wouldn't be interested in human beings and might be doing the program that we do with animals who might be an endangered species. And so we tag them and we take care of them and, and uh, help them along and study them. And so, you know, I think he's, that, that, that was a great relief to me to hear finally an, a 
federal government official making a statement like that. And for the uh, government uh, people, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Lukatsky from the DIA, uh, acknowledging that we uh, have paranormal activity related to all of this. You know, the, the nuts and bolts investigators for many, many years and, and still today will not uh, consider orbs as part of the evidence. But about 65% of experiencers of contact with what we believe is extraterrestrials have what appear to be conscious orbs in their homes. They we see them, you know. So uh, there, there's been a huge disconnect between uh, what is real and what is not. In 2011, I gave up being a nuts and bolts investigator because I came to the conclusion that it was scientifically dishonest that to exclude some of the evidence just because you didn't want to believe it or you wanted to write it off as uh, something else, which it is not. And if you are a diligent investigator uh, and you really do your research, you'll know it is not related to uh, earthquakes when it's in your home over and over again, and it communicates with you. And sometimes it uh, pops into a full-size non-human. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with how can you continue on and omit some of this information, or maybe not, whether it's omit or not include, you're not getting the full picture. So therefore you're not doing your full scope of research so yes. that's, uh, you know, I give you a lot of credit. You know, you've been courageous for many years and that in and of itself took a lot of strength, I'm sure, to step down. And so. It did, but I have just come to the conclusion that if people challenge me, I'm simply not going to respond because I know that years ago I was in that same position. Mm. I had difficulty with Jacques Vallée. Dr. Jacques Vallée years ago, when he started to talk about all of this, I was uncomfortable. I wanted to hang on to the nuts and bolts and try to explain uh, the craft that simply fades uh, from uh, into nothing uh, as, oh, it just must have flown away at such a rapid rate that uh, it was, uh, we misperceived it or something like that. But you know, Jacques Vallée was right. <laughs> Alan Hynek knew about this as well. Uh, a lot of the early investigators knew, but it was so difficult for so many people to accept it that they uh, just didn't speak of it publicly. Uh, so I, I really do have a great deal of respect for uh, Jacques Vallée for the work that he has done and to bringing this out to our attention many years ago, we finally caught up with him. <laughs> and, you know, there are many that are lagging behind, but I'm, but it's only ignorance. It's that they just have not moved along far enough in their research. And I've been involved in this for so many years that I finally had to accept it, even though it was uncomfortable. And it also, was also very uncomfortable to understand dimensions. Uh, but I, the ETs have explained it to us. And th that is in my new book, Forbidden Knowledge. And you bring up so many great points, right? It took a while for people to catch on, just like it took you know, a myriad of now up to what, 17 agencies that we at least know about in the US government that have their hands and feet and everything else in, in these programs to mm -hmm. finally admit that there are these UAPs. Was there any apprehension? I know you said you were kicking and screaming to tell your story. You didn't want to do it, 
but you did it. What was that thing that just pushed you right over the edge, Kathleen? Well, I was, uh, I work at a lot of different conferences and there would always be a psychic medium that who would come up to me and say, you know, you really ought to tell your own story because it will help so many people. And I thought about it for years. And finally, I was on the stage with Whitley Strieber and um, some other experiencers. And there I was pretending to be a researcher. Well, I mean, I'm a researcher, but I was pretending not to be an experiencer. <laughs> and I just thought, well, this is very strange because people started to write um, that they couldn't respect researchers because researchers had no understanding of what it's like to really be an experiencer. And I thought, well, I guess I, I had better better admit that, yes, I have been ex an experiencer for many, many years. And so I do know what it's like to be an experiencer. So that's why. <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing your story and uh, going back a little bit and thinking about like the early days of of your research and knowing how many i mean gosh i believe i read somewhere that you had interviewed over 5000 experiencers is that is that accurate i can't say that i've interviewed the okay. 5000 the figure of 5000 uh, is the number of participate in all of our okay. studies. So I've right. worked on wow. three studies on experiencers, um, two of them with PhD scientists. And the, the third one was an early, smaller study that Denise Stoner and I did together. And so I have probably talked to a 5,000 as well, but I just don't count. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the things that you feel like later on in your investigative research you learned to maybe do differently and maybe adapt maybe a different set of, you know, use a different set of tools that you learned from early on in your investigative research? Well, early on in the investigative research, we were looking for physical evidence. Mm. And so it was uh, evidence of an implant. Uh, using a powerful magnet to look for an implant, um, evidence of fluorescence on the body. Okay. Go into take a black light, go into a dark room and look for fluorescence. Uh, it was looking for um, any kind of residue on clothing. Uh, so there was a big focus on uh, this physical evidence, and. If you didn't have physical evidence, you, you were supposed to take a dismissive attitude. Mm. And as an experiencer myself, I had a great deal of difficulty with that. I finally said, I'm not going to do that. I told those people because I said, I don't live in your head. I don't live in your house. I don't know. I'm not going to pass judgment on you. And I know that some people hoax, but I have a policy where I, uh, I never reveal anybody's name. And if, they, if people want complete confidentiality, I honor that too. I don't talk about their experience in any way because this is something private and personal to so many people. And people in the past have been harmed when their story was released, uh, such as my aunt and uncle. They never intended to release their story. It was uh, done as a result of a violation of confidentiality that carried the story to a newspaper reporter in Boston, Massachusetts, and he did his own investigation. And uh, he went to Betty and Barney. They said, please don't do this. We'll lose our standing in the community. We'll lose our jobs. We're not going to cooperate. Well, he did it anyway. And fortunately, they didn't lose their jobs, but it was extraordinarily stressful for them when that happened. And eventually, it led to uh, 
the intrusions in their home that I spoke about. There's Travis Walton. He never wanted to reveal his story. He was missing for five days. Uh, The crew was uh, under suspicion of having murdered him. Uh, It got out to the media and it became a huge story. And I saw Travis carry that pain in his body for so many years. Uh, Phil Class was a person who was responsible, at least partially, for what for Travis's pain. Instead of using compassion for this young man who had this experience, and there was evidence, a lot of evidence that this was real, uh, he did his best to destroy Travis's life. And, you know, that's that's just not something that anyone should do to another person. Uh, And Phil Class did it over and over again to experiencers uh, of of contact and also people uh, with good reputations who had close encounters. He did it to the police, for example, in some major cases. Uh, He did it to Lonnie Zamora in Socorro, New Mexico, where there was a plethora of evidence uh, that it was true and real. So um, I, I finally, I came to the point where I had to reach out to people and say, you know, give people the tools to do their own investigations. And in the, my last book, extraterrestrial contact, what to do when you've been abducted. Uh, It's all about, it's a comprehensive guide for experiencers, and it includes instructions on what to use, how to investigate your own case, how to collect evidence, Uh, because it's experiencers who need to do this. And it's experiencers who, in my opinion, uh, need to tell the world that this is real and it's happening all over the world through CE5 experiences, uh, through people who speak with ET councils or have communication with ETs. So it is moving along. Uh, It's going to be a long time. It takes uh, humans a long time to accept things, especially when uh, it, the information is troubling because when you talk about the different dimensions, as I mentioned earlier, then you get into religion, then you get into the paranormal. And, uh, you know, I, someone recently, I I talked about the council of eight in an experiment that I did. Uh, And it was scientifically oriented. And in the end, Uh, I could take it to a court of law, I think, and prove it in a court of law, along with the other researchers that I did this with, uh, to determine whether we were actually speaking to a council of ETs. So what, uh, you know, I think that we have to realize that uh, it takes people a long time to accept these kinds of things. Uh, A lot of my colleagues are having difficulty with this because you think of it as woo-woo. You think of it as, you know, a medium whose eyes are rolling back in their heads and they're making something up and putting their hand out for your money, that kind of thing. But I know that many experiencers are also mediums. That is a gift that comes along with having these experiences. You become more spiritual. You become psychic, you become empathic. And, uh, you know, it just is part and parcel of being an experiencer of positive or neutral contact. And I'm so glad you're saying this because I feel like there may be someone or many people out there who may have had an experience and they're not even sure. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're not even sure how to articulate that to somebody without quote unquote sounding crazy to someone Mm. else because it's stigmatized for so long. And that mental health component is so crucial. Absolutely. And you know, for years I tried to explain away my personal experiences. I, 
Uh, is it uh, sleep paralysis? No, it's not that. Uh, is it hypnopompic or hypnagogic hallucinations? No, it's not that. Uh, is it, and why isn't it? Because there's evidence, because there are witnesses in three of my events. Uh, you know, so you, how, how can you explain that away when the, I'm, people are looking for me and I'm missing right. and I'm on that craft? <laughs> Because I would have been in my home. Um, also, um, I uh, I wonder: Do I am I fantasy prone? Well, no, I'm not fantasy prone about anything else in my life. People consider me to be very grounded, but you go through that process of analyzing yourself, at looking at your evidence. Of, and I, I ended up uh, taking the American Personality Inventory, uh, in an inventory that was developed by Bud Hopkins and uh, a uh, Ted Davis, who was a psychiatric social worker and an, an a- academic psychologist. And also uh, standardized and uh, statistically verified by Dr. Don C. Don Derry, with whom I worked on one of the studies I mentioned. And so uh, in that, when you take that test, there are 65 questions, uh, and you will either uh, score as someone who has what they call UFO abduction syndrome, meaning that you have the information and you have the uh, emotional signature of an experience or contact. Or you might be a simulator, or uh, they also call it a wannabe, someone who would really love to have this happen, knows a great deal about it, but doesn't have that other part that the UFO abductees, what they called them them, had. And then uh, there was a third category, and that is just members of the general population who don't have a great deal of knowledge uh, about contact at all, that sort of thing. So I scored on that test very, very close to target, meaning that I had almost all the characteristics. So finally, I said, oh, I guess that's it. I guess uh, I am. <laughs> and But it took me many years of, I think, investigating my own case and uh, collecting evidence before I was willing to say even to myself, yes, that happened to me. Even though it happened to my mother too, and she and I were together, I was always, I guess, in denial or skepticism. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I, it, part of it has to do with my uh, scientific training as a social scientist, um, uh, part of it had to do with my uh, taking this, a lot of psychology classes in in college, and psychologists are the last group to accept any of this. They're always looking for a psychological explanation. So, in the surveys that have been done among academics, the the physicists would be willing to accept it. The physical scientists uh, much were much more likely to accept it than psychologists. They were sort of at the bottom of the group of people willing to accept any of this. So, uh, you know, that that's part of what where I was coming from. It was also skepticism expressed by um, the, the what some people call debunkers, or I call disinformants, because a lot of these people I later learned uh, uh, add bunk to the story. They mm. they're not debunkers. They add the bunk. <laughs> so um, that that's why I call them disinformants. Hmm. I I know that you had the opportunity or many opportunities to do some actual tactical research, actual documents you've researched. Have was there ever anything that you when you were researching that just jumped out at you and you just it changed your perspective on where you thought you were going and then you found something and it just shook your paradigm? Well, that happened many times in, mm. in my archival research. Mm. 
And uh, it started out with my investigation of the history of government involvement in the investigation of UFOs, their major studies, um, the decisions. I, I had all of the historical records from the government, uh, the CIA interest in UFOs in 1952. And uh, that led to the Robertson panel in 1953. And, you know, the reasons for the cover-up, but also the statistics from the government's major studies. In, in 1952, uh, Project Blue Book uh, had a major study of 1,500 and uh, almost 1,600 cases. And uh, they did a chi-square analysis, quality analysis. They divided these UFO reports into different categories. Are they balloons? Are they birds? Are they aircraft? Are they uh, meteorological phenomena? Are they uh, psychological? Are they hoaxes? Um, and 26, almost 27%, 26.94% of those cases ended up being true unknowns, meaning that they could not classify them or categorize them as anything on this planet. That's a pretty good percentage. Yeah. Uh, they did another study, a larger one, 3,201 cases in 1955. It took more than a year to do it. But uh, in the end, they did the same chi-square analysis. The possibility that uh, uh, an unknown was simply an unidentified known uh, was less than 1%, 21 and of those cases. Uh, were true unknowns. But the government had an interest in covering all of this up. So it's really fascinating to me. In fact, Stanton and I wrote a book called Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers about that. So you can read that for the entire government history. But also, I did things like went to the American Philosophical Society, where Dr. Donald Menzel, who uh, was a professor at Harvard, um, he was an astrophysicist, and uh, at the top of his field regarding his reputation, but he had a secret life. And Stanton discovered that when he went to Harvard to do research on Dr. Menzel, and he found a letter where Menzel said, wrote to John F. Kennedy, uh, I can tell you more when we're properly, uh, uh, what do you call it? We're properly vetted or something to eat one another, that they would be given permission to speak with one another, where Donald Menzel could share classified information. So, uh, you know, Donald Menzel is a curious character because he's also uh, listed as a member of MJ-12, you know, and, and so MJ-12 as, you know, Stanton was scratching his head. How could he be on MJ-12 and be such a huge debunker? Well, it fits very well into his personality, we found out. It would be something that he would take pleasure in doing. He loved to doodle um, little ETs. And uh, in 1953, after the uh, Robertson panel met and decided that the scientists should use logical deduction to uh, dissuade the public from believing that UFOs were real. They would just present some kind of scientific scenario. It didn't matter if it really applied to the case or not. Uh, that's when Donald Menzel published his first anti-UFO book. So um, it was interesting. In the files, I found uh, letters pertaining to a meeting that he had at the Pentagon in 1952. And he went uh, to a number of uh, chiefs of staff and he, he said, I here, I have this simple solution for all UFOs. And I just did a few simple tests and I'm going to explain them all away as meteorological phenomena. And uh, the, the men in the Air Force, the Navy, those who were there said, no, why should we lie? Why should we believe 
that a few simple tests that can explain anything of the about this. And Menzel was furious. He he stomped out of the room. And you know, if you know that history, if you know who was doing these things, uh, Philip Class didn't come on board until 1966. I found a letter where Philip Class wrote to Donald Menzel. Donald Menzel thought Class had a PhD too, which he didn't. He had a bachelor's degree in engineering. But anyway, uh, Menzel wrote back to Philip Class. I'm I'm happy to have you on board. I'm getting sick of doing this. <laughs> I'm getting tired. And so then we have Philip Class, who had been in trouble with the government. Actually, um, he was suspected of being a spy. He was. Uh, socializing on a regular basis with uh, so a young man who worked at the Soviet embassy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so he was a, a bad boy. He had also, he was a writer for uh, Aviation and Space Technology magazine. And he uh, had revealed some classified uh, documents in the magazine, in articles. So, uh, mm-hmm. The, the government would have taken him to court, only it couldn't without revealing that information. And so uh, this was just another way to sort of punish him and tell him, well, we'll think of you as a good boy if you'll do this work for us. Mm. I think that that's what happened uh, because he had no interest before 1966. And then he was working uh, at the magazine and also more than full time uh, as a UFO disinformant. Interesting how that works, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> with the recent, oh, and I say recent, over the past couple of years, obviously, before, you know, the beginning of the pandemic where, you know, the American public was made aware that the government was admitting, yes, there's, or UAPs. Did mm-hmm. you question the motive behind that at all? I had been quietly watching the government for several years before that, and uh, on television programs about U- UFOs. And uh, for for many many years, uh, there would be an expert in the UFO field who would come forward and uh, give testimony on camera. And oftentimes that person, even like Stanton Friedman having a master's degree in nuclear physics and having worked for 14 years uh, in that field and and advancing as any professional would, he was a genius, Uh, but he would uh, be uh, talked about it as sort of a, a UFO enthusiast mm. or something like that. And then uh, they would haul out one of these disinformants who would simply lie, would tell a false story to the public. Well, all of that stopped in about 2013, I think it was. And I was heartened to see that. And so I kept watching it and I was wondering if, are they going to finally come forth with some limited disclosure? And finally, on December 16, 2017, they did. So that was a big and courageous step forward for the government. And I'm not going to criticize them, you know, saying, well, you lied to us for 70 years or whatever. I, I congratulate them on finally coming forward. And I know that the reason they lied is because they were concerned about public hysteria. Mm. So they educated the public. They allowed this education to take place over many years. And they had to reassure the public that uh, these things are not going to harm us. They're not here to destroy us, to enslave us, to eat us, whatever. And so, you know, I think that's, uh, I appreciate the fact that the government is doing this and I appreciate the continuing research that they're doing. I really admire the scientists and the government officials who are involved in this. It's, it's great to, to be at a point where, 
you know, I can, and I'm sure you can really remember a time when just talking about UFOs or talking about aliens was very difficult in just regular conversation without someone giving you the eye or saying something under their breath. And, and now we're at a point where people are a little bit more open-minded and open-hearted. Yes. Yes. I think that um, all of that uh, propaganda that had been disseminated that uh, let people know that UFOs have been visiting us for a very long time, that they haven't harmed us, uh, mm. was important um, uh, as a lead up to the announcement. And they continue to release information a little bit at a time. And so as not to cause public hysteria, I think if suddenly we had public hysteria, um, they would slam the lid shut again. And I would hate to see that uh, because they're doing really good work, particularly in uh, areas like the paranormal overlay. Mm. And that's important because there is definitely an interdimensional uh, part to understanding all of this. Uh, a lot of these uh, entities are coming from the, from the fifth and sixth dimensions. And you said this earlier too, you know, with, with having to really literally wrap our minds around the acceptance of multiple dimensions. Mm -hmm. What are some ways you feel like you're able to help open hearts and minds to the, I guess, acceptance or the even possibilities of additional dimensions? You know, that was really difficult for me to wrap my mind around for a long time. Was, what do you mean? How can I understand what it is to be in a higher dimension? So the way I finally learned the ET, as the ETs explained it, and I was able to put it into uh, terminology that people could understand mm. is, okay, we, everything has a vibrational frequency. All of us uh, have our in motion. We have a molecular structure. Everything is moving. Atomic energy is moving. Uh, the atom is 99.9% .9 empty space. And so since we are all moving, we have that vibrational frequency. We also have phase which is even more difficult to understand because it's um, if you can align frequency and phase, then atoms can interpenetrate. And that is how they could use their technology to move us through closed windows and walls and ceilings, that sort of thing. So the way I try to explain that is uh, say that we are, take a pan, and take an ice cube or a few ice cubes. Those ice cubes are humans in physical form. Boil it, boil it, that water. It, uh, it, the, the molecules become energized and they're moving a lot uh, faster. And so they rise into the air as steam. Those are the entities that we see who are not fully materialized. They're the shadow people. They're the, uh, the sort of mother of pearl kind of people, the, what we might see. Uh, then as we go further up, the water residue is still there in the air, but uh, we can no longer see it. Those are the higher vibrational entities, uh, the fifth and sixth dimensionals, who are not lowering their frequency, but they're still there. You, we can feel them. I can feel them in my presence. I feel a very strong electrical tingling sensation. And sometimes uh, I can hear high-pitched tones in my head when this happens. Sometimes I can uh, receive a telepathic message. Very rarely. I'm not very good at it, but I'm trying. I'm learning. Uh, so, you know, that's the, what my understanding and the way that I feel that I can explain it to others. I think it's a great analogy. That's, that's fantastic. It's, it's great for people to be able to visualize that in a tangible way. So 
Thank you for sharing that analogy. You're welcome. <laughs> it uh, when we we think about the, those dimensions, and like you said earlier, you know how beings or even their craft are able to go in and out of these different dimensions because they have this advanced technology. On top of everything, you're saying you feel this vibration or you have this energy within you. And it's interesting to try and explain to people that, for instance, when you kind of have that sensation, uh, I used to say it as a child, like I would have a sensation, like I would know if a television was turned on. Like you couldn't hear the television, but you could kind of feel that a television was turned on because it just was emitting this sort of wave or this sort of thing. And that changed over time because we no longer were dealing with tube energy. We were dealing with, you know, digital. Um, so even thinking about it from a technological piece, why do you think there are certain individuals that are more in tune with different energy fields than others? Well, I, I believe that experiencers are because we've been taken um, to different dimensions over and over again. We de develop a sensitivity to that. We also develop all of the characteristics of near-death experiencers as well. And I wonder if it's because as our body becomes energized, as we're moving into that higher dimension then we're having like a near-death experience because uh, our consciousness, our soul, uh, is sort of on a thread attached to all these parts of us, but we're, we're not dense the way we are now. And once we enter their dimension, then uh, we become dense at that fifth or sixth dimension. Mm. So I think that's why I don't know uh, if for people who are not experiencers, if they're perceiving this as well, I can't explain that. I don't know. Hmm. No, no, fair enough. It's uh, it's just a, such a fascinating field that, you know, we're just learning more and more about now, um, which I think is great to your point earlier where it takes humans a little while to catch up. <laughs> um, and we're definitely not using our, our brain's fullest potential at all. Not just yet anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have coming up, Kathleen, uh, over the next uh, six months to a year? What's, what's coming down the, the line for you? Well, we are finally going to have live conferences again. I'm so thrilled after having most of them be virtual for a couple of years. So uh, I have... One coming up in Pennsylvania, I believe it's the end of April, uh, the Butler Ghost Conference. Then uh, it's either in May or June. It's all on my website, Kathleen-Marden.com. But uh, McMinnville, Oregon, the McMinnville UFO Festival. So I'm excited for that. I love to go up there as well. Uh, after that, I have uh, the Roswell. UFO festival over the 4th of July weekend. And uh, the weekend after that is MUFON's International Symposium in Denver, Colorado. Then uh, if the town of Exeter approves it, we will have the Exeter UFO festival again over Labor Day weekend in Exeter, New Hampshire. And then uh, a couple of weeks after that, I'll be in Michigan at uh, another UFO conference that is pretty much uh, experiencer oriented. And I'm not sure if I have any after that or not. <laughs> Still an extensive schedule. <laughs> Yeah, I will, when I was doing this uh, full time before the pandemic hit, I was doing, oh, about one a month, wow. but not during the winter months because sure. you know you, it's a big risk for people flying. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of winter travel, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> especially being from New England myself. Uh, it's just it's one of those things where it just you know. I mean, if you wait a day, it changes, you know, <laughs> like yeah. 18 degrees one day, it'll be 60 the next. Don't worry. 
Oh, yeah. I lived there for many, many years before I moved to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you have at least some nice steady temperatures. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's it's easier <laughs> to yeah. live in Florida for sure. One hundred percent. I know you just I mean, you have a brand new book, Forbidden Knowledge. But I mean. Are you working on anything new? Is that how how do you work? What's your workflow like? If you are you the kind of person once you finish with something, you you start getting all these ideas and you got to document them? Well, I do a number of different things. Uh, besides writing books, I do television shows. Mm-hmm. I've done quite a few of those. Um, I have another one coming up. I uh, do as. <laughs> podcasts and radio shows very frequently. Mm -hmm. I offer consultations for experiencers for only $30 on my website. I I finally started to charge because I I had so many people asking to speak to me without charge that I couldn't get my work done. And I said, I have to do something here. I need to make an income. (laughs) I also uh, do uh, forensic hypnosis and the quantum healing hypnosis technique. So that's another thing that I offer. And in terms of what I'm going to do next, uh, I just wait for that to come to me. And I know when the time is right, it's sort of like, well, the universe drops this on me and, and it's time to educate the public about it. I love that. It's it's a wonderful way to go about, uh, in my opinion, because uh, I'm very similar. So I, I can align with that. With these different, I guess, offerings that you have through your website, uh, what's some advice you would give some individuals if they were seeking to have maybe some sessions with you? Uh, are you talking about a consultation or yeah, hypnosis? Sure, either or. Like, What would be some tips sure. or maybe some things for folks to maybe expect if they were interested? Well, in terms of a consultation, it's a one-hour consultation. I can do it by telephone or I have a Zoom app. So uh, I can do it by Zoom as well. And I just, I'm a listener. I I listen to people. Uh, They want advice. uh, So I comment. I have developed a a psychic sense where I uh, feel a strong tingling in my crown chakra if something has a Uh, a tone of reality or truth. So I can tell people I'm feeling that there now. And so, yes, this is true. A lot of times when I talk with people who are experiencers and are okay with what is happening, I feel a a strong tingling as well. Mm. And so I can identify them, even if they're not sure. I can say, yes, I feel that. Or no, I'm sorry, I just don't feel it. Maybe you are, but I, it, you know, it's not uh, resonating with me in, in terms of my physiology and whatever this is. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and, and with hypnosis, uh, I have, I do this on a very part-time basis. People, a, l- a lot of times will fly in Uh, to have hypnosis with me. I have first began studying this 30 years ago, and I used to offer it again free of charge. (laughs) But then it became so expensive for me to keep those certificates up, to do the additional training, to have the insurance and the facility, everything that I had to start charging. (laughs) And so um, I do offer that. I do require people to have some conscious recall of their experience. And uh, the difference between what I offer is the the less expensive one and the shorter one, which is probably spending uh, between four and five hours with me, sometimes longer, um, is just a traditional forensic hypnosis technique. Uh, I will interview a person for several hours first, because I want to know the whole story. I want that person to know me and I want to know that individual. And then I just do the regular hypnosis to get to um, one or two experiences that they've had. 
forensic, uh, not forensic, the uh, quantum healing hypnosis technique is different in that I have the ability by studying this through Dolores Cannon and her daughter uh, to um, call on the higher self or uh, um, the super conscious of the person. And uh, to ask that individual's questions, people will bring you know, 10, 15, 20 questions to have answered after the hypnosis session. And then if people want healing, um, I can facilitate healing as well. You, through the, that person's higher consciousness, but also something happens to me. And that same powerful tingling comes through the top of my head and out through my arms. And I just feel like a calling that I have to hold my our hands out. And even though they might be a foot or two above that person, oftentimes they can feel heat radiating from my hands. And I always make a tape recording. Uh, or a vi voice recording. I'm, I still use old terminology. I use it too. <laughs> a voice recording for that. And I have a thumb drive and that person will take the, that home with them. When they have QHHT hypnosis with me, I ask them to listen to the healing part of it every day for four or five days, just to cement that healing. and then. If a year or two later something happens and they're beginning to feel the pain or whatever it is again, to go back and listen to that all over again, because generally the pain will go away. Wow, that's that's great. Super extensive. That's great. Uh, I love how into detail you went. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. And with QHHT, I'm devoting probably eight or nine hours. Wow. To that. So I ask people to devote that amount of time. Yeah. I'll have a Zoom meeting ahead of time. I always ask people to, if they don't meditate, to do some of the guided meditations on YouTube on a daily basis, just to condition themselves to relax and enter an altered state of consciousness. And then I will do a pre-hypnosis induction with them and give them uh, words uh, so that I can say those words to them and they will go into a state of hypnosis immediately. It just cuts out time on the day that they see me. Yeah, makes sense. So we can devote more time to exploring what they want to explore. Wow. That's great. And you said folks can go to Kathleen hyphen Martin, uh, Martin, 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 M -A -R -D -E -N. Dot com, <laughs> dot com. right? Com. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's and, true. Yes. Okay. Where else can folks find you on the internet? Do you have any social media that folks can follow you on at all? Um, on, I would say probably Facebook. Also, I go to Twitter once in a while. I go to the other social media sites once in a while. Sure. But sure. Um, Facebook and the one that is attached to that, I can't remember what it's called. I don't have time for social media <laughs> a lot, but when right. I have something coming up when uh, a speaking engagement or uh, a new book, something like that, then I'm on Facebook. Announcing. Awesome. And, and, and also on my website. Yeah. Kathleen-Marden.com. Folks can find that information. Mm -hmm. And that new book, Forbidden Knowledge, The Personal Journey from Alien Abduction to Spiritual Transformation. Uh, I strongly recommend that book to folks. So hopefully people listening and watching will be able to take a chance and check that out. And we, you just said 60th anniversary, right? And so new updated information on uh, that book as well too, right? Yes, that's, that's true. A new updated scientific evidence and analysis of the evidence in that case, because we've moved ahead technologically. Absolutely. Well, Kathleen, I cannot thank you enough for joining me today. It was my pleasure to be with you. You're such a kind and gentle oh. person. Oh, likewise. Thank you so much for everything. Okay. And thank you for all your work. And sincerely, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your strength. And, and just thank you for helping people and, and sharing all that passion and that spirit with people.
I think it's extraordinarily important, especially in these times that we're living in. And there you have it. I cannot thank Kathleen enough for taking the time and her energy to spend with us today. We talked about so much in this episode. I really can't say enough positive things about what Kathleen does. I truly applaud her courage as well as her empathy and advocacy for experiencers. Kathleen also shared with us the upcoming release of the 60th anniversary edition of her best-selling book that she made with the late great nuclear physicist Stanton T. Friedman, captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience. This upcoming 60th anniversary release will have new updated scientific evidence and analysis included. We also talked about her newest book, Forbidden Knowledge, a personal journey from alien abduction to spiritual transformation. Be sure to look for Kathleen at Kathleen hyphen martin.com if you're watching this be sure to hit that like button subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you can find out about new episodes you can find us on instagram at itd.jcosta as well as on twitter at itd underscore jcosta we can't thank you enough for listening and supporting this podcast and until next time take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself Thank you.